Chapter 6, The Prayer of Intervention Just about everything I have covered thus far can be summed up in a powerful illustration through a story of both tragedy and triumph. Jesus spent three years training his apprentices in the ways of the kingdom. He ascended to the throne so that the Holy Spirit could come. For when Jesus was here in body, walking the dusty roads of Israel, he could only be present to those in his physical presence. Now that the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus can be with each of us personally, intimately, always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 20. This story picks up after those events, after his ascension and Pentecost. The young church is exploding. Tensions in Jerusalem are heating to the boiling point. The collision of kingdoms is about to shift from Jesus to his followers. Let's see how well the young church has learned their lessons on prayer. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish leaders, he arrested Peter during the Passover celebration and imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod's intention was to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, chained between two soldiers, with others standing guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel tapped him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was really happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate to the street. And this opened to them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally realized what had happened. It's really true, he said to himself. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod from what the Jews were hoping to do to me. After a little thought, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally went out and opened the door, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them what had happened and how the Lord had led him out of jail. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said, and then he went to another place. Acts 12. Everything about these events is told so well. In such realistic detail, it must be for our benefit. First, notice how the fates of James and Peter are set in contrast, one against the other, in one narrative flow. The story of James's execution is reported in one sentence, quickly, abruptly, like the event itself, like the swift fall of the sword that took his life. A few words, and it was over. It is so abrupt, it is almost violent, as was what happened. Peter's story takes longer to tell, because Peter's story is a story of rescue. The next thing we notice is that Peter's deliverance appears connected to verse 5. The church prayed very earnestly for him. Scripture includes and omits things for a reason. James seems to have been seized and executed rather suddenly. The church is not reported to have been praying for him. Were they caught off guard? Then Peter is seen. The church is reported to be praying earnestly, and his outcome is different. Whatever you want to make of the contrast, they are contrasted with each other. Peter's story clearly illustrates the prayer of intervention. The Greek for very earnestly is the word actenos. It is the very same adjective used to describe the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. 
and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Luke twenty two forty four. What a noble and sober comparison. There in the midnight olive grove was held the greatest prayer vigil of all time. We can be sure Jesus was praying with every ounce of his being, empowered by the Spirit, eyes fixed on his Father. Eugene Peterson translated the action this way. The church prayed for him most strenuously. Acts 12 verse 5. That is how the church is praying strenuously and it produces dramatic results. This is the prayer of intervention. They are intervening in prayer for Peter, intending to change the outcome of events. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there with them that night, heard first and what and how they prayed? Let's see what we can discover from the text. In verse 5, it mentions they had gathered to pray. Then we have the story of Peter in prison and the appearance of the angel. Did they call down angelic help? Surely these devout Jewish Christians knew Psalm 91 by heart, a great psalm of deliverance. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Verse 11. They knew the famous Old Testament stories of angels coming to the rescue of God's people. Stories like Daniel in the lion's den and his three friends in the furnace. And the writer of Hebrews gave us the world view of the young church on angelic assistance. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews 1 verse 14. They assumed angels are here to help us, even serve us. In a collision of kingdoms, you can be sure they were calling upon all the resources of heaven for Peter's release. It is safe to say they were calling on the angels of God to come and help. Anyhow, an angel does show up. Notice also that there is quite a bit of story told between the first mention of them praying and Peter's eventual arrival. Notice that there is quite a bit of the story told between the first mention of them praying and Peter's eventual arrival at the house, which takes place later that night. Peter is arrested and thrown in jail. That's when the church is reported to have been praying. He falls asleep. It's doubtful that happened as soon as he was dumped in a cell. Imagine the emotions and adrenaline swirling within him. He knows what happened to James. It was likely hours before he could fall asleep. The angel wakes him up. He gets dressed. He follows the angel through the city streets. The angel disappears. Peter then decides to go to the house where they are praying. The text implies they are still gathered in prayer when he gets there. It is safe to say that their prayers were not quick. They were going at it, apparently for some time, perhaps hours, perhaps all night. Just like Elijah on the mountain, they would also know Elijah's story by heart. This allows me to interject something about repetition versus the zap view of prayer. The zap view of prayer. Christians have been told over and over that God is almighty, and indeed he is the God of 400 billion billion sons. We have been told he is also sovereign, and indeed he is. Perhaps out of respect, we have adopted the notion that if he is going to act, he is going to act quickly. Bam! Zap! If we are honest, I think we adopted that perspective because it also relieves us of strenuous prayer. But is this what we see in so many of his biblical accounts? Clearly, God does not zap Peter out of prison. The church had to pray strenuously for him. The event goes on into the night. He does not zap the promised rain either. Elijah had to climb to the top of the mountain, and there he prayed eight rounds of intervening prayer. God did not send the angel to Daniel the first day he prayed, but it took three weeks for him to break through. God didn't just zap Joseph, Mary, and the child Jesus down to safety in Egypt. An angel had to come to them as well. They had to flee in the night. Even the greatest crisis of salvation, with the destiny of human souls hanging over an eternal precipice, even there, 
God does not simply zap. We know his heart longs for man's salvation. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9 God desires every person to come home to his heart, find refuge in Jesus. He therefore has a gospel message he passionately wants brought to the world. But does he simply reveal salvation to every man, woman, and child in one swift, global, immediate, and irreversible act? Clearly not. Despite his intense desire, he does not zap salvation over the earth. He does the wildest thing ever. He entrusts the task to us. Delegation. Are you getting the picture? Prayer is not just asking God to do something and waiting for him to zap it. As those friends, family, and intimate allies of Jesus gathered in the night to intervene for Peter, clearly they didn't believe one simple prayer would do it. A few quick Our Fathers would not have taken all night, nor would it have been strenuous like Gethsemane. Intervening prayer often takes time and it takes repetition, repeatedly intervening and invoking. Eight rounds for Elijah. I was awakened at 3.30 a.m. this morning. At first, I did not know why. In our house, dark of the night interruptions are usually the result of some spiritual attack, but I did not feel darkness in the room. Gently, the Holy Spirit reminded me that our dear friend is in the hospital in great pain. I turned my heart toward Jesus, I am learning, and asked him how to pray. As I tuned in to God, I sat up in bed because I knew this needed focus and intention. I then began to call upon the life of God to fill the body of our suffering friend, for that is what I sensed the Spirit urging me to pray. Your resurrection, life, and glory to fill him now, Lord. I invoke your resurrection, life, and glory to fill him now. Settling into the task, I simply stayed with the invocation. Your life, your life, your life. Over and over again, your life, your life, your life. Ten minutes went by and the Spirit was still moving me to pray. Life was urgently needed at that moment, and I was called upon to invoke it over and over and over again. Twenty minutes, then thirty minutes of praying, your life. I think many Christians have gotten the idea that repetition is unnecessary, maybe even wrong. Didn't Jesus warn us, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words, Matthew 6 verse 7. The issue he was addressing was not repetition. The issue was motive. He had been teaching all about motive just before he taught this. As two other translations help us see, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered only by repeating their words again and again. New Living Translation And techniques for getting what you want from God. Message Version Surely, when you worship God, you don't simply say, I love you, and walk away. One sentence is not sufficient for that. If we feared repetition in worship, church services would last three minutes. The Psalms are filled with models of repetition. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever the moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. Psalm 136, verses 1 to 9. No doubt the people would respond. 
His love endures forever as they worship together, repeating it 26 times in this psalm. So repetition is not the issue. Motive is. As I continued invoking your life, I wasn't chanting magic spells. It was not the mindless turning of the wooden prayer wheels in a Buddhist temple. The prayer of intervention requires sticking with it, as Elijah modeled for us. Effective prayer is often like the felling of a great tree. It takes repeated blows. The church gathered at Mary's certainly knew this because they were at it all night. We know that Jesus did not mean to teach us to shun repetition in prayer because he used it himself in Gethsemane, praying over and over and over again the same thing, take this cup from me. An old saint who first taught me to pray, may he be blessed forever, would often say, when you think you're finished praying, you're probably just getting warmed up. Often, when we first turn to prayer, we are coming in out of the matrix, that whirling, suffocating Mardi Gras of this world. And it takes us some time to calm down and turn our gaze to Jesus, fix our gaze on him. We begin to tune in and align ourselves with God as his partners. That itself takes some time. Much of the early stages of our praying involves not so much interceding, but getting ourselves back into alignment with God and his kingdom. Once in that place, we can begin to be aware of what the Spirit is leading us to pray. Furthermore, as we press into prayer, we are not simply begging God to move, but partnering with him in bringing his kingdom to bear on the need at hand. Enforcing that kingdom often requires much staying with it and repetition. Last week, I was outside chipping ice off the driveway. Winter had fallen like the hammer of Thor, the ice on our drive had built up enough that we couldn't get our cars up the hill. Unlike soft snow, you can't just shovel ice off. Chipping it away requires a certain technique. There is a way things work. You have to do it in little three and four inch sections. In my hurry and impatience, I started trying to take away bigger chunks, but it didn't work. If you stick to the small bites with each hit of the shovel, you can pop it right off. It's quite satisfying, actually, but it requires patience, a slow and deliberate sticking with it, a perfect metaphor. This is so important and hopeful because many dear folks have given up on prayer, having concluded it doesn't really work, when in fact quick prayers often don't work. Simple little prayers aren't sufficient to the needs of this world. There is a way things work. Back to the story of intervention. Back in Acts 12, the church was gathered and they were praying earnestly, strenuously, like Jesus in Gethsemane. They were praying over time. Notice also that they were praying in unity. Many were gathered for prayer, verse 12. Surely they remembered their master's instructions on that. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Matthew eighteen nineteen to 20 Prayer is more effective when we get several people agreeing with us. That's just how it works. This is not to say our personal prayers do not have great power and effect. They do. Elijah was alone on the mountain. Daniel appears to have been alone in his fast. Ananias went alone to heal Saul. But let us also accept the truth that the power of agreement in prayer is not to be overlooked. I think we can also assume the intercessors gathered at Mary's home understood their authority. They sat under Jesus' teaching on it for years. Everything that we have covered on authority, they had heard and seen demonstrated. In fact, between his resurrection and ascension, Jesus lingered more than a month with his disciples. And look what he stayed to give them further instructions on. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Acts 1 verse 3. 
He was continuing their education on a theme he had been discipling them in for years. The gospel Jesus taught was not merely the gospel of salvation. It is repeatedly referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Matthew 4.23 The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, like the yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour, like treasure hidden in a field. Matthew 13, verses 24, 31, 33, 44. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. Jesus had told them to invoke the kingdom. He gave them authority to do so. He also provided instruction on the process. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew sixteen nineteen. He taught them to bind and release, given all they had seen and heard, given their rich tradition in the scriptures. I think it is safe to say the prayers on that night at Mary's home might have sounded something like this. Our glorious Father, Abba, we exalt your name. We glorify you. We worship you tonight. We proclaim your glorious rule, majesty, and dominion. For the sovereign Lord is most high. He reigns over all the nations. You set up kings and pull them down. The nations are yours, O Lord, and you give them to anyone you please. The nations are a drop in the bucket to you. Herod cannot defy the living God, for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and of your rule there is no end. Jesus, our dear Jesus, we cry out to you. We declare that all authority in the heavens and all authority on this earth has been given to you, Lord Jesus. All authority in the heavenly realms and all authority on this earth has been given to you and you alone. We proclaim it. You are Lord of the heavens and Lord of the earth, Lord of all creation. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Herod is nothing compared to your power and majesty. Holy Spirit, come and fill us with your power. We wait upon you Come and fill our prayers with power from on high. Lord Jesus, our King and Deliverer, we invoke your authority and your kingdom over Peter's life. Your kingdom come, your will be done tonight over Peter's life. We declare and we proclaim that Peter belongs to the Lord God Almighty. Herod has no claim on him. Peter has been purchased, ransomed, and redeemed by the blood of God's Lamb, by the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. We call down the kingdom of God over Peter right now this night. Send your angel to free him. Lord, break the rod of his oppressors. You set the captives free, O Lord. We proclaim it. You set the captives free. With a mighty arm and an outstretched hand, you freed your people from Egypt. Come and free Peter now by your mighty arm and outstretched hand. Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Break the chains that hold him, Lord. Reveal your mighty strength. Almighty God, ruler of the heavens and earth, you humbled Pharaoh with your majesty, Humble Herod now, humble Peter's captors. We invoke the power and majesty of your kingdom over his life tonight to break every chain that holds him. Holy Spirit, we pray you would comfort Peter. Come upon him now in your love. Comfort him. Sustain him in his affliction. Strengthen his faith, O Lord. Fill him 
with hope in your deliverance, for you are a mighty deliverer. Break the chains that hold him. Send angels to deliver him. We bind Satan from taking Peter's life. The prince of this world has been cast down. He has been judged. We bind the strong man who has laid this claim upon Peter. We cut him off by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. We bind Satan from Peter now in the authority of Jesus Christ the Lord. By the blood of the Lamb of God, we break every claim upon Peter, and we release the kingdom of God over his life. We proclaim Peter's freedom, and we proclaim his release. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Sovereign Lord, our Redeemer, we call to you in our distress. Reach down from high and deliver Peter. Rescue him from his enemies. Bring him out into a spacious place. We enforce the majesty of your kingdom and your mighty rule over Peter's fate. We enforce the claims of your kingdom over his life in the authority of of Jesus Christ the Lord. No doubt they kept circling back through each theme, each person adding something to the growing momentum as the Spirit moved them. They were proclaiming the truth, invoking the kingdom, enforcing the kingdom. The prayer of intervention involves a flow of proclaiming, invoking, and enforcing. They proclaimed, they invoked, they enforced just as the Psalms taught them to do, just as Jesus taught them to do. The last part of the story is just so very human, it adds humor and believability to the whole account. Peter miraculously appears at the door, and they are so astounded they don't believe it's him, even though they've been praying all night for this very thing. Don't you appreciate that? You are watching very real human beings here. I'm embarrassed how many times I've been surprised by the answer to a prayer I had been diligently seeking. I love that the Holy Spirit, having just given us a very sober story on the prayer of intervention, adds a comic touch at the end. Then Peter takes off for points unknown to lay low for a while. These men and women do not have a naive view of the story they are in. They know that they are sheep among wolves. A few more examples. Now we can come back to the wildfire, the angel, and the prayers that saved our home. It might help you to know that I recently learned from a local pastor that his home was also miraculously spared. Ours was not an isolated incident. The fire jumped its lines and moved with such speed it took many people by surprise. Like with the account of the execution of James, It may well be that the praying church had not been alerted in time before the fire started devouring homes. Once they saw what was at stake, the strenuous prayer kicked in. I personally know many of the men and women who were praying for us. Like the crowd gathered at Mary's home, they are people who are trained in the ways of the kingdom. These men and women know who they are in the kingdom of God, not orphans, nor slaves, but sons and daughters of the king, his friends and allies believe that intervening prayer is more than just asking God to do something. Understand authority and the authority they have been given, and they are bold enough to use it. Choose to unite with others in prayer in order to increase their effectiveness, and accept the truth that the authority they have been given extends over creation. Jesus made it abundantly clear that his authority extended over the laws of the physical world. He shut down a storm on the Sea of Galilee with a command. He fed 5,000 with a few morsels. All of the healings demonstrated his power over creation. As our friends intervened in prayer, one of the things they did was to bring the kingdom of God over our property, enforcing and commanding with authority that the fire stand down, They forbid it to cross our property line, and it did not. 
when our van was spinning out of control across that field of hailstones and I shouted, Jesus, as I embraced for what was about to happen next. It was more than just a cry of the heart. It was that for sure. The prayer of intervention does not do away with the cry of the heart. But something powerful, forceful, and commanding rose up in my spirit. Jesus was not only a cry for help. It was at the same time a command, a one-word order that meant, in the name of Jesus Christ, no. I was exercising authority. I was enforcing the kingdom over our immediate need. We do not have to be passive victims of life, waiting until a distant God chooses to do something. We are friends and allies of our intimate God. He has given us power and authority to change the course of events ourselves. Human beings are meant to intervene, to engage, to make a difference. We can move mountains. It's in our DNA. If you will pray like this, you will begin to see far greater results.